I am currently mm-hmm. here with Ryan Cairns, who's a Leith boy, mm-hmm. who's currently based in Dundee. Yep. Um, artist. Yep. Um, you working class. Yep. Um, you are poor. Partially. <laughs> <laughs> Partially poor. It depends when the weekend comes. It's usually up to Sunday that I have no money. <laughs> um, and then I need to wait again until that comes back round. Yeah. I feel you. That was like, yeah, it's pretty much my... Yeah. my Waiting week. for a paycheck week to week. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And that's like, well, not anymore. It used to be like that up mm. until literally this year. Yeah. And um, they from art. Mm-hmm. God knows not from art. But um, suddenly I've got like a stable income and it's a whole different ball game yeah. where you're like not having to really um, just desperately count to get all your change in order to get a loaf of bread type yeah. thing. Yeah, And um, And this is like... But I then... had to do that this morning to get the last of my leg in. <laughs> oh, fuck. <laughs> It's a, like, uh, it's, it's a real um, kicker because like especially over this past year with COVID and stuff and we suddenly had a lot of the arts community yeah. uh, were all greeting their eyes out because they weren't getting work and they weren't able mm-hmm. to do all the things they were doing they were all scared they weren't getting any money right. and I was like uh, that's my life since mm-hmm. I've been an adult it's totally, just me yeah. trying to scrape together money yeah just trying to get by day to day sort of thing mm-hmm. yeah. and so when folk are greeting their eyes out thinking that they're not going to get paid for doing the thing they love mm-hmm. and it's like wow well, we've all been trying to do we don't, none of us do what we actually love no. to get money. That's yeah. not one of the things. Um, speaking of which, the thing that you love doing, so you're an artist, mm-hmm. um, you make art. Tell me a little wee bit about your art, where it comes from. Um, so it's actually funny. A lot of my art, it kind of contrasts with itself. So I do, it's quite, yeah, mixed media. Um, I use a lot of acrylics in my painting side. I use a lot of acrylics, a lot of spray paint. Sometimes... Um, oil paints but I do quite a lot of photography as well mm-hmm. so it kind of bounces off each other one another and I kind of get <laughs> annoyed at myself because I kind of really decide which one I want to follow through with uh-huh. so I'll be painting for a week and be like why have I not been doing photography and then I'll do photography for a week and be like I miss painting you know what I mean so I'm kind of struggling right now to try and find which one where my loyalties lie kind of Person don't think that they have to actually, mm. you know, they don't have to be one or the other. They can yeah. be both. Of course, they I can know, be both. I know that's the thing. I mean, you're still de- developing your practice the way. Yeah. So um, as your practice develops, there'll be a way. There'll be a moment mm. of absolute clarity. Yeah, it's no, like, totally. you're like, holy fuck, yeah. that's exactly what I was meant to do. <laughs> yeah. Both of them are together. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I like mean, Lewis both describe ourselves as um, just we fanny about. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. Anyone asks me what my my medium is, I just say I fanny about my mm-hmm. top off. Yeah. I get paid sometimes for it. Yeah. And that usually surprises my family and friends and yeah. the networks up north. Uh-huh. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> so like, um, so how are you finding like you know the practice mm-hmm. with you know with the economic disadvantage that we mm-hmm. that we all experience being being poor and you and you have your peers who don't have the same level of economic economic disadvantage. Yeah. Um, are you finding like, one of the things that a lot of us that we've, I've in, during these conversations a lot mm-hmm. a lot of us have kind of uncovered that we find it hard to take risks mm-hmm. because we, we it's, there's going to be a, a fallout from it sort yeah. of thing. Are you finding that in your practice? Sometimes I find more in the situation I am in without having a lot of money to sort of spare to make art. I find myself struggling to be happy with the materials that I'm using because mm-hmm. it's all really cheap materials that I'm using so the outcome isn't that good you know what I mean you can kind of see like you're paying for what you get kind of sort of thing so I'm using like pound land paints pound land canvases and I'm like do I really want to be doing this all the time but at the same time there's no other option you know what I mean so I'm just trying to basically find what I can when I can whether that be going into skips or like finding it on the street Mm -hmm. taking it home and try to do something with it that is going to basically turn into something you know what I mean Instead of just lying there. So, have you heard of ad hocism? Mm-mm. It is no. a style of practice. Yeah. It was coined by Charles Jenks, the architect. Okay. Um, and ad hocism is like the the adverse reaction to uh, specialism. Yeah. So, if you are a painter and mm-hmm. you specialize in painting yeah. and you use a certain type of paint and a certain mm-hmm. type of canvas to create a desired result, yeah. you have a kind of a very clear line of what needs to happen in order for it to to mm-hmm. be delivered or, mm-hmm. or the output to be what yeah. you wish it to be ad hocism is solving the problem using whatever means are within your reach yeah. in as quick a possible time mm-hmm. and it's got its own aesthetic mm-hmm. um it's got its own kind of vibe i'm, I'm an ad hoc artist mm-hmm. lewis is an ad hoc artist yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a pretty, like i think most people who suffer from any kind of de- economic disadvantage or who are poor mm-hmm. 
Like, um, like that's the kind of line that we always take. It's like, right, I have this idea in my head. Mm -hmm. How am I going to make this idea a reality using whatever I have available? Totally. Yeah. And we may, like, for example, I make films. Mm -hmm. And I do performance work. Performance is great because you don't actually fucking <laughs> cost anything. Yeah. Um, but like, so I use, I use like my own iPhone and I yeah. use my laptop and yeah. I can make all the films I need to and I don't mm. need to hire out um, equipment from like or buy a specific camera to get the kind of desired result. I just yeah. make do with what I've got. Mm -hmm. and, that's, and that sounds like something that you're going to be working your way into. Totally, yeah. Um, I'm finding myself doing it daily, actually. Mm. Like yesterday, for example... I took a quick trip past the charity shops and found a lot of like canvases that I'd been painting on, like literally what me and Lewis were just talking about. Uh. And it was <laughs> like I seen people had their prints on them and they were just lying outside the charity shop. But my initial reaction was, I'm going to paint over that. Yeah. It's a free canvas. It's lying on the street and it's not going to cost me money. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it's just having that initiative to take something and make something with it. Yes. You know what I mean? And I think I kind of feel like there's something more attractive about that you know what i mean mm -hmm. taking something and kind of making it your own as well it's kind of like a personal touch you got your coffee cup oh yeah, yeah. So, so, carry on talking it's fine <laughs> no, no, carry on, get your coffee cup and carry it? on talking it's over there <laughs> yeah it's a casual conversation it's not like we're gonna be like no i was going, just like so unprofessional where did, where did i put it <laughs> <laughs> thank you, you very much not a problem um, it actually sounds probably quite nice having this coffee pouring sound and everyone yeah. jealous and <laughs> filling up their coffee pots as they listen to this. All um, you need is that. Aye. <laughs> You're not having a proper drink unless you go. Yeah. Run up. Oh, thank you. That's a problem. Um, aye, that's, that's the thing. It's, and that's actually one of the basic uh, things about art mm -hmm. is that we take something which we see as being, as we've perceived as being valueless yeah. or worthless, and we turn it into something valuable. Mm -hmm. Paint on its own obviously costs money, yeah. but it's just minerals mm -hmm. and it's just oils yeah. and it's just in or a medium in which the the color to go through. Yeah. And then when applied onto a canvas, which again mm -hmm. is just cotton, it's cheap materials yeah, really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, within an, the art world, it can come become thousands of pounds. It's yeah. like. How? Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's the idea that gives it the value. Yeah. And that's what we, we kind of train ourselves to do as artists, is to mm -hmm. find low-cost materials to turn into something which then is worth something. Mm -hmm. It's a bit odd. Yeah. I um, kind of like the development of that as well. So when you can kind of talk about the procedure of making something to paint on, like your backboard, your canvas, if you've no went and bought it, first of all, for a shop, and you went and found out you've got a funny story to tell. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's always a story about no just the painting that you've made but the procedure you're going to get the hang of paint on you know what I mean like that's a story by itself without actually having the story of the painting you yeah. know what I mean um, which I find quite nice I like that having a wee conversation with a thousand like where did you get that for and they're like oh I found it in this alleyway behind somebody's house <laughs> I'm like brilliant yeah you know my master show the rug that I had there I found it outside uh, a bed outside my ex-boyfriend's house mm -hmm. um, and that was like there we go and he's like where'd you get the rug car so I found it in the bin <laughs> and you always and it's like that, uh, like mine at school, like bin raker was an yeah, insult, yeah. bin raker, but mm -hmm. actually bin raking is one of the coolest things to do. Like me and Lewis being up at the, the warehouse today, that's mm -hmm. all just house clearance stuff of folk yeah. who've died, yeah. like buildings that have been ripped out and refurbished mm -hmm. and all the furniture just goes into there and there's amazing mm -hmm. stuff, it smells like death, but it's it's amazing yeah. and there's every single one of those items has some sort of other story Yeah, it's got its it. own unique touch to it. Yeah. yeah. No, I like that a lot, especially if you can go into somewhere like that and you just find a piece of furniture is completely different to the last piece of furniture that you've just seen. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? The way it's been made, the look at it, like the colours, like, yeah, I'm dying to go up there. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I've not been up yet. I'll get you in, I'll get you hooked up. He'll, yeah. Doug will help you. Uh -huh. um, he's amazing. He just wants to, he just wants to see, make sure those places, those things go to a good home. That's mm -hmm. all he wants. Yeah, um, totally. He's more than happy to help out arts, arts, art folk. Mm -hmm. really. That's really good. Yeah. Um, so, Lewis was saying you do graph. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about that. So, uh, <laughs> it's it's funny doing a, a fine art course and doing graffiti because a lot of the times I feel like I can't incorporate it with my work because it's partially illegal, you know what I mean? And sometimes I have the back thought in my head, like, are the boys going to turn up to my classroom? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but... Um, at the same time, it's nice because I know that I'm doing something that I like and I'm not stopping doing it because I'm trying to do some swanky, uh, like, philosophy piece, you know what I mean? I'm doing what I like and I'm still documenting it. I'm just trying to take it in a different light. So to try and get into that 
I want to say like middle class way of making art. I've changed the name of it. I've called it a performance piece mm -hmm. rather than graffiti. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Because it is a performance piece. It is. If what people are walking past you, you're out in the street, you're making all these daft movements, standing, like squatting, doing, like you're taking a shot. You know what I mean? Like if people are walking past you, seeing your mistakes, it takes mm -hmm. away the comfortability of making mistakes in your own house. Uh -huh. You're outside, people are seeing this, like, like minute after minute. You need to, like, you're aware of these people walking past, they're staring at you, and you just need to kind of concentrate on what you're doing. Yeah. You don't know who's passing behind you, because you're not looking. It could be anybody, it could be somebody coming to you around. But you're just, in that moment, trying to get it done. Mm -hmm. Which I find kind of nerve-wracking, but it's also really, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, it makes me sort of... I don't know what I'm trying to say. Like, there's something about it that, at the end, you're like, I've just done that out in front of people and I've not done it in my house. It's got sort of like a gratification behind it. You know what I mean? Um, finishing something out and you know it's going to be there for at least a week before it gets done over <laughs> again. But, yeah. That, that's mm. something that I've had quite a few conversations. One of my, one of my best pals is... Um, uh, runs a street art trail within Dundee mm -hmm. and um, commissions a lot of professional graph artists yeah. to do public pieces. A lot of artists get commissioned by him to, mm -hmm. to put things in places that are allowed, yeah. there's permission. Mm -hmm. And um, there's, I find it quite unsettling mm -hmm. because I see graffiti as being a public expression of ownership over their own environment. Yeah. And when you take in commissioned artists to mm -hmm. go and... Um, put a piece of work that is, a, is what's the word, um, well, allowed mm -hmm. by the authorities, yeah. it takes away that public ownership mm -hmm. of people's right to make marks in their own space. Yeah, totally, yeah. I find it to be a bit classist. Mm -hmm. And we've had discussions about this, and I think he has um, opened up his ideas. Like, you know, if I don't like it when a well-known graph artist gets all upset because there's menches. Mm -hmm. It's like, but that's yeah. what it is. Yeah, totally. That's what you're doing, but you're just, like... I'm, I'm using inverted commas here, <laughs> like elevating it. Yeah. I mean, it's still art, yeah. it's still mark making. And it's also a public contribution. You know mm. what I mean? Once it's out there, it's out there. You no. can't, you don't have a say what happens to it after that. That's it. Why you know is, what I mean? when folk get angry when there's a dick drawn on their fucking mm. mural, I'm yeah. like, well, sorry, pal. Yeah. But like, that's, I mean, <laughs> I love dick drawings. Uh. They're my favourite. <laughs> um, every single time I find a dick drawing, I'm just like, well done, world. Mm -hmm. um, it is, like, it's the fight, I think, to be a, a a beautiful uh, expression of masculine um, insistence that they exist. <laughs> I'm here, look, a penis! Yeah. <laughs> um, and one day I'll start drawing vulvas over everything. <laughs> um, but, like, and it makes, like, so, do you feel the same way? Is that something that kind of, as, well, what, that's mm -hmm. what, what I'm actually asking, is that like, when you started off doing graph, mm -hmm. did you find that, that um, environment to be hostile in that yeah, way? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And also, there's just that, I think when you first start writing graffiti, you're looking for gratification in other writers, especially people you admire. Um, so when I was really young, maybe about 15, I'd be coming from a small town, Preston Pans, coming into Edinburgh, mm -hmm. and I'd constantly see the same, same names, same names, and you sort of grow like a vision in your head of what these people look like and how they might sound, you know what I mean? And then you end up meeting them, and it's completely different. Like, I've met people who, who write graph that are actually the loveliest people that I've ever met. And you would not expect that. You're expecting them to be crackpots, basically, yeah. wanting to fight you, like, threatening you. But it's not always like that. Like, mm -hmm. some people, like, welcome you with open arms. They're just happy to see other people expressing themselves. Yeah. And I think that's one of the nicest things about it. So when you end up meeting somebody who's really, you can't be doing this, you can't be doing that, you're like, fuck off, mate. Like, <laughs> let, let me paint. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, that's all you really want to do. Mm -hmm. It's just paint. You know what I mean? And by only allowing, by only, um, you know, allowing access to those public spaces by people who have earned the right to do that, mm -hmm. then I just don't understand why it's like, um, I don't understand why graph is illegal in the first place. Mm -hmm. I understand what people's reasonings is, but I think it's pointless and classist and stupid. Yeah. Um, but by only allowing that certain people who've made the name, it's like, yeah. it's, what is that about? It's, yeah. it's limiting the potential of what graph and what street art can be. Yeah, totally. Um, and it's preventing us from having any kind of um, diversity within our within our urban environments, mm -hmm. which is bullshit. Yeah. I'm not happy with it. And also, what's the difference between having a letter and a character? 
you know what I mean? You might have somebody that's done a stencil and it gets preserved because mm -hmm. it's a stencil picture, but then you've got a word there that gets taken away a week after. But like, it's just somebody expressing themselves in a completely different way, mm -hmm. but you're deciding to keep something here and actually preserve it for the rest of the time and then take something away completely different. Like, it doesn't make sense to me. The preservation of um, commissioned street arts, mm -hmm. uh, street art works is for me a, a definite like uh, no no mm -hmm. I mean if you can't allow a menshi on top of your thing then yeah. you don't understand what you're doing yeah. um, and, oh, mm -hmm. that gets me so riled yeah. up because I used to go out the back of because um, I'm from Elgin yeah. and obviously there's not exactly a street art scene there <laughs> and we go up the back of like abandoned buildings and stuff and uh. just experiment and draw and all my stuff was like mask and tape yeah. and, and just doodling but like uh -huh. trying really hard and like, a lot of marker pen kind of illustration -y type things and mm -hmm. stuff and of course you like that you don't care yeah they don't care like it was never going to be an issue because you knew what you're doing was bad yeah when you kind of level it if, like if it's all going to be allowed let yeah. it all be allowed exactly if it's yeah. only some of it's going to be allowed that's exclusionary and that is um that is what's the word I'm, i've not enough coffee yet <laughs> and that is it, yeah it's, it's naughty it's not, yeah. not very nice it's I mean, like how you're saying about the dick drawings it's like having a variety of dick drawings but only allowing a certain Type of dick drawing being allowed on. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, why is the one with foreskin being allowed, but the one with foreskin has been taken away? Like, what's the difference there? Yeah. It doesn't make sense. Like, what makes a dick drawing an o um, okay? I mean, like, we've got so many examples of dicks up in modern art galleries mm -hmm. and in like traditional art galleries mm -hmm. and as museum pieces, and those dick drawings, because yeah. they're in a frame yeah. and sanctioned by you the authorities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's seen as being a, a work, a, a work, a, it was a work of art. <laughs> but when a dick is drawn on a wall, vandalism, vandal, vandalism. Really? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it's I do stone. Yeah, and it's like an imaginary line. You can't mm -hmm. see it, but it's there. You know what I mean? And yeah. everybody knows about it being there, but nobody's actually seen it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, it's, it's um, some people are artists and some people are not, which mm -hmm. is something I just do not believe. I think yeah. everyone, if mm -hmm. they have a, if the ability to create, has yeah. in some sort of way art within them mm -hmm. and I don't think art sh artists should be the ones who are only allowed to make art it's mm -hmm. extremely exclusionary yeah. and I'm all for inclusion <laughs> yeah and I think also back to the graffiti thing about one of the reasons why I like it the most um I find they're quite like a, a satisfaction right when you go somewhere you've maybe not been there in a while and you see your name you know what I mean or you see your pal's name mm -hmm. and you're like when the fuck did they go there how did they get there like yeah. that's in the middle of nowhere you know what I mean? And there's also that, that storyline that you sort of build up in your head and you like you can imagine them being out in the mid midnight, like jumping <laughs> over fences and you're like, that's mad, honestly. Well, that's really beautiful, the idea of like mapping it like like a it's like a underground ephemeral and linguistic map of mm -hmm. where your network goes. Yeah. Like those hobo signals mm -hmm. that they would the signs that hobos would carve to say, you know, yeah. um like like safe here, dangerous yeah. landlord or whatever. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and almost like having that ability to kind of traverse the city in an alter alternative way. It's uh -huh. very psychogeographical. Mm -hmm. Have you come across that yet? No. Oh, you're gonna get into that. Yeah. Psychogeography is brilliant. <laughs> I'll get I'll, I'll give you some links after this. Yeah, that'd be good. Um, it's the idea of like opening up the city for different pathways to be used in different ways. Uh -huh. Um instead of it even being used for, you know, get up, go to work, mm -hmm. go to shops, come home. Yeah, yeah. Which is like the A to B to C mm -hmm. that um capitalism allows us to do. Yeah. Taking the alternative routes where we can take ownership over our cities, ownership of our urban environments. Mm -hmm. Especially as people who are working class, mm -hmm. it's like we don't really have ownership of anything. The only thing we own is our labour. Yeah. And even then we don't own that, mm -hmm. you know? And so it's, so by allowing us to have some sort of uh, influence yeah. over our you know, immediate environments. Like, mm -hmm. so did you grow up in a scheme? Yeah. Yeah. And how was your scheme for graph? Um, so I actually grew up in a few different schemes. Um, I was jumping about quite a lot as a kid. Mm -hmm. So originally I grew up, right in Bottom of Leaf, um, it was called Dryden Gate, and round about Edinburgh there was a massive graffiti scene, mm -hmm. um, it was always happening, because I used to stay beside the train line as well, mm -hmm. so there was a big, big abandoned building right beside this train line, and that for me was basically where I originally started taking inspiration for graph, um, I just loved seeing people, older kids, older kids, guys, when I was a kid, sneaking in there with their hoods up and that, getting up to no good, and I was like, what are they up to, you know what I mean? Okay, and um, <laughs> after that, I moved to Pilton, which was near the college. That was a little bit rougher. Not a graph scene at all up there. That was more of a 
young team mentality. You know what I mean? So, like, to have been doing graffiti, it wasn't cool. Um, you were actually a bit of a gimp for painting <laughs> the graffiti was. Um, I think anything creative was seen as a, a weakness. Mm -hmm. um, and that, more so when I moved to Preston Pans after Pilton. So I moved to Preston Pans when I was 11. Mm -hmm. Started going into um, first year of high school. It wasn't cool to make art at all. Mm -hmm. um, to be cool, you had to be a football player or about to go into a trade or get an apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it was kind of hard to start fighting against that stigma to start being a pain on my own back because in Preston Pants there was nobody to look up to mm -hmm. that had previously done graffiti. There was nobody to ask for tips or anything like that, where to go, how to not get caught, where to buy your paint. Mm -hmm. um, so I literally had to find this out over a period of time going back and forth to Edinburgh. Um, and that was a nightmare because you really felt uncomfortable producing art in the public. Like, not even just the time of making it, you knew people were judging you, but after it being there, people were like, who the fuck's made that shit? You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and it wasn't until I started getting older and started getting more, um, what's the word, like, confident with what I was making and how I was, like, sort of um, expressing myself that I didn't really care anymore, you know what I mean? And I was like, come on, fuck you, somebody do what I want. Like, yeah. you're writing your initials into a bench. How can I not write a tag on a wall? You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. um, so I think at that point, that's where it started developing. And then all my pals were actually going into um, trades and getting apprenticeships. Mm -hmm. all, all the guys in my family, they did the same thing. Mm -hmm. So to tell my dad and my uncles and that, that I was going to go and study art at Granning College and no be a join her, it was kind of like... You failed the family. <laughs> <laughs> so we're not going to look after you uh, when exactly. this all was in the pan. Yeah, like, yeah. what are you, what you going to be jumping about in a tutu painting walls? Like, like how are you going to make a career out of that? Um, and I'm still kind of, like, trying to work that out, really. Even now, like, I've been studying for about four years, college-wise. Mm -hmm. um, I had no qualifications in art in high school. My actual high school art teacher told me I'd never be able to be an artist. Same. Um, and that <laughs> always stuck to me. I don't know about you, but it was like, I, it was a fight against that. And I was like, no, that's exactly what I'm going to do, actually. <laughs> like, fuck Good. you. Good, that was the same. Oh, it wasn't exactly the same, but in the same way, I was I was always uh, told that mm -hmm. I wasn't any good at art. Yeah. And I love the fact that I've got a master's now. And yeah. I love going back and being like, uh, yeah, yeah, I've actually been working in the arts for ages. Yeah. And what did you do? You mm -hmm. went and got your teacher training. And that's something I learned in later life, mm -hmm. being an old lady now, um, was that those oh. teachers I know thank you I'm not old I was waiting for that <laughs> Jesus it takes ages to get home right here yeah. um, I, something I kind of understood is that because it, that it was pure projection on their half that yeah. was two seconds I'm actually in the middle of an interview um <laughs> I'll go and see what that is. I'll pause that for two seconds. So workies have turned up to do some plastering mm. and I wasn't warned about that. Uh, so it's fine. Um, but it's okay. I've got to do a job. I've got to do a job. Yep, so everybody's got a job to do. Aye. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, it was just all projection. It was just all... Um, all uh, That's clearly from their perspective of them going, this is the only way to do art. And mm. and, and, it's, and educa like secondary education is no place for anyone to learn anything. No. It's actually just a... Uh, it's like a gulag. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Even like that sort of form of education, I don't feel like anything that I learned there has benefited me today. You know what I mean? Like there's no core base skills. Even the sort of maths that you learned, like I've not had to do trigonometry since I left. Yeah. Or you know what I mean? Like why have you been wasting so much time when you could actually be learning how to like sort of things like gas, electricity, do your rent, um, right. you know what I mean? Like taxes. Life like skills. Totally. Like Insurance, <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? Like, bits and pieces that you've got to trip up along the way and none of this has been set up for you, like how to sort of conquer this as soon as you leave school and it hits you. You're like, whoa, you know what I mean? Like I've just became an adult yeah. and now I have no idea what I'm doing. Mm. And that's, I think there's a vulnerability in all in all of us when we leave school and then and leave or leave family home and then go into this kind of big wide world mm -hmm. and we kind of know what we want to do I mean, like i wish that someone had told me because I, I came to i went to art school when i was 24 mm -hmm. and before that i'd start I, I was 20 i was 18 when i was when i f um fell pregnant my son mm -hmm. my eldest son so i was um I went, to, I went to do philosophy at uni at that point, which yeah. is, again, another bullshit degree. I yeah. can stop doing bullshit degrees. <laughs> and um, I, it didn't even kind of come to me until much later um, 
what was the compliment this? I was going somewhere with this. Fuck, I can't mind. Um, all these kind of stages throughout development. And like, I didn't go anywhere near where I thought when I was a teenager what mm-hmm. I was going to do and stuff. Yeah, like, not totally. I, it's, it, it's something that just kind of, you kind of get pulled into the path whether mm-hmm. or not you, you want to or yeah. not. Did yeah. you ever find that, like, when you were finishing up, um, sort of then, maybe like sixth year into secondary school, that the way that it was presented to you, like it was now or never, that you could either go to uni now or you never would. Yes. Because um, that's how I felt, mm-hmm. like completely. I left school, the end of sixth year, with next to no qualifications. I kind of stayed home just for a laugh. It didn't become what I wanted to do. Um, so I started working full time for a year. And I was like, I don't want to work full time. I've just left school. This mm-hmm. is shit. Like, mm-hmm. minimum wage. I kind of want to go back into education, which the year before I never thought I'd do. So I applied for college, no portfolio. I just kept on going. And I'm like, now I'm in uni. Never thought I'd be in uni. Never thought I'd have the chance after leaving school to go to uni. But it is possible. Mm-hmm. And they never really... They never let you know that. Like, it's really annoying. Yeah, I mean, that's a big life lesson that you can literally change mm. any course at yeah. any point in your life and go and do anything you want. Mm-hmm. Okay, nothing is ever too late in that sort of regard. We, but yeah. I think... I blame capitalism. <laughs> I always blame capitalism and the patriarchy for everything. But um, yeah. there was that kind of that urge that we have to understand what our path is and we have to succeed and we have mm. to get really good. It's such a young age as well. Yeah, that's a lot of pressure. Mm. I mean, like, for my kids, I've always said to them, it's like, you're going to go travel. Mm-hmm. And, like, I've also I've said to all three of them, you're getting a trade. Yeah. Regardless, once you've got your trade, you can go and study whatever bullshit degree you want to study. Yeah. Like, but if they're going to go to uni, they have to do it in something that they actually want to learn. It's not yeah. about a job. Uni is not about jobs. Mm-hmm. This idea, I think it came out in the 80s or 90s. I think it was probably the 90s. I mm-hmm. think New Labour had a lot to do with it. Um, this idea that your, your going to university will be some sort of like vocational mm-hmm. uh, development for our young people and allow um, uh, class, uh, what do you call it? Class ascension. Yeah. Um, and that's not what uni's for. Uni's there to, mm-hmm. dis- to become a master, in vi- oh, no, become an, an expert in a subject. Yeah, yeah. No, not necessarily to go and get a job out of that. Yeah, and also to like sort of um, develop what you're already interested in. You know mm. what I mean? So you might be interested in, say, something like philosophy, but you don't really know how to approach the subject. No. So to go and sort of develop that and really be sure about something that you're interested in, I think it's quite a good advantage. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, uh, like you say, you don't always have to have a job for it, but to have a sort of... Um, what am I trying to say? A sort of... Uh, satisfaction that you know what you're talking about yes you know what i mean and you've kind of you've went to the full extent to find out what you're interested in mm-hmm. and now you've got it yeah um, that's the secret i think that's the secret to, to uni is just is study what you're interested in mm-hmm. if you can study what you're interested in then you'll love it and then at the end of that sort out the career afterwards yeah. we can all make money through lots of different means mm-hmm. not through art yeah. it doesn't happen <laughs> it's so limiting <laughs> but there are so many ways in which you can explore the use mm-hmm. of art i mean um Art has never been the the teeth that provided. It's always been mm. the, the you know the, something that sucked away my money. It's yeah. never been able to provide me with a viable income. Yeah. Social care did. Yeah. Social care provides me that, and social care offers me a lot of opportunities to be creative and yeah. to to use my art powers for good and yeah. not evil. Yeah. You know, and um, it's tough, isn't it? Like, especially if you're using like sort of the last of your money to get these sort of like the equipment that you need to say paintbrushes paint if that's your practice mm-hmm. if you want to paint and then you're using the last of your money with that hope that you're going to be able to sell something and make it back and that isn't it always the case you know what I mean sometimes you're sitting there with a bunch of paints and paintbrushes but no food yeah <laughs> and what good is that I know, I know. Um, there's a great system that apparently I'm not sure if it still exists in the Netherlands where they subsidise artists especially early career artists they subsidise them mm-hmm. to um, to exist so they don't have to worry about food yeah. while they're creating work mm-hmm. And that's a great system to have in place. It's yeah, like yeah. where they can actually support young artists to go and do that. Mm-hmm. At the same time, they should be doing that for folk who who are working in other... Like, I, th- I think art gets a bit, a bit self-involved sometimes. Yeah. Um, thinks that it, all of its problems are mm-hmm. unique to itself. But yeah. what I've noticed in third sector art um, production, like such as with Generator and with mm-hmm. other ARIs, is that it's all that kind of like, artists need to be paid mm-hmm. and need to be paid a fair wage. I'm like, yeah, other third sector... Um, organisations that are not involved with art have the same problem. There's yeah. lots of volunteers that are, but they're not screaming out about it, you know? Yeah. It's a different thing altogether. Yeah, it also feels like there's sort of like a war against art right now. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, they just don't want you to seem to use that as your practice at all. Like, mm-hmm. 
I don't know what it is, like, just even the funding, like, there's no sort of general funding for working class artists, like, even people that are still studying at uni. So, like, I, I went to uni this year, it was the first time I went to uni, and um, I'm getting, like, the lowest amount of SAS you can get. I get enough to pay my rent, and that's not even enough for the gas or electric. So I find myself on a weekly basis going Why to Why is the, that happening? Because I'm missing all the boxes just. So I'm 23, you need to be 25 to get a bigger amount. I've had to have apparently lived by myself for three years, I've only lived by myself for two years. You had to have worked for full time for three years before you go to study. I've only worked time, uh, full time for one year before I went to study. So it's all these little brackets that I'm just missing. And it's ridiculous. Because um, multiple people on the same course, they're getting up to, what, £300 more than me. Um, and not to be a bit angry about it, but they're also in a better position. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I can see this on a weekly basis, and it's kind of... Aye, disheartening. Aye, that's, that's not right. Um, I'm going to close that door over because it's yeah, noisy. Totally. Um, <laughs> referee. Um, yeah, that's really... That's not right. That's... Yeah. Um, there's something really up there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I would say we. I'm now invested in your in your economic future. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to help you solve this problem. I just lie. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's a tough one, eh? Because, like, you're put in that position trying to benefit yourself, but you don't really feel like you are at the time. So, like, mm -hmm. I'll be taking a trip into the um, community fridge to go and get something for the day. And I'm like, is this even fucking worth it anymore? I could go back to Edinburgh, try and get a full-time job again, but mm. I'll be stuck doing something that I didn't like doing, and then probably get depressed. Um, so, is it worth it? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Fucking hell. Yeah. Oh, my God, I'm, I'm really angry for you. That's not all right. Mm. It doesn't make any sense, because obviously when I went, I, I'd been living out with the family home, because I you know, obviously had kids and like that, so mm -hmm. I was 24 when I went to art school, and by that point, I kind of met all the criteria that they needed to give me an absolute yeah. full whack, so mm -hmm. I was getting shit tons of free money. Yeah. <laughs> it is free money, sass. <laughs> it is free money. I don't think you think that we're actually going to pay that back. No, I know. <laughs> it's no. not going to happen. No. Yeah, <laughs> we're just going to change our names and addresses and anything that's been in contact. Pretty much, pretty much. <laughs> I heard that somebody um, uh, literally after, just just after they graduated, phoned up and said, I'm now a house husband, I'm not going to go and get a job. Oh, really? And they just apparently wiped the whole thing clean. That's mad. I was hearing that. something about if you go to another country for three years, or that amount of time it gets wiped, if you're at the country. Sweet, let's just flee. Yeah. After the van, we could just fucking go to Mexico. <laughs> not right? Jesus. Yeah. Oh, like, oh, I'm so sorry that's fucking happening. That's not right. No, no, and like, to be honest, the uni didn't help much either. Mm. Um, so uh, on the back of that, when I first moved to Dundee, I was absolutely struggling, lost my job due to uh, COVID. Mm. Like, never done anything wrong, just the pure fact that I couldn't go back and forth to Edinburgh to do my current yeah. job. So I got cut off from the wages, wasn't making any money, and then I found myself applying for the hardship fund. Um, that was ridiculous. Mm. Took over two months to get anything. Jesus. That, at that point, you could be starving. You know what I mean? Like, literally, they don't know the situation that you're in. I sent them bank balances, message after message. You're like, right, we're going to look at your uh, your application. Two weeks will reply. Look at the application. Two weeks have passed. We're going to give you this much money in two weeks. That's a month. Yeah. You know what I mean? Why does it take a month for you to make one decision and send it online? You know what I mean? <laughs> and that's the thing, like, um... If you were part of, within the system, if you were in the system, mm -hmm. as in the social care system, you would be given so much. Mm -hmm. Because that's that's what that exists there. Once you're in the system, and people get all really upset about folk, like, oh, benefits, and they're all getting all this stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, because they're within the system, and that's what they get. Like, there's plenty of folk like yourself, like mm -hmm. what happened to me when I was when I was younger as well, wasn't in the system, just mm -hmm. out of the criteria, yeah. missed out on all the finances, yet had all the struggle. Mm -hmm. Like, what you might do in that situation, that's yeah. like a... A little intermediary space where you just can't fucking do anything. Mm -hmm. you can't look after yourself and you can't get looked after. Yeah. What do you do? Yeah. Die. I know, I know. And it's really disheartening because when you're actually trying to make art, it just lowers your motivation. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And you end up producing stuff that you're really not happy with because you're not in a good place. Um, so it, it does show, mm -hmm. like, the position that you're into, what you're actually making. Um, yeah. And there's a desperation that can comes through. I mean, I know that when I was, just after I'd left 
my undergrad and there was definitely a desperation that was shining through my art that I was poor and I needed mm -hmm. money and please buy my work yeah. like that showed mm -hmm. and that's not where anyone wants to be because nobody nobody wants to nobody vibes with desperation mm -hmm. they don't want to touch it with a fucking yeah. 10 foot barge pole mm -hmm. but they want something you see value in but you're yeah. like I don't have any value in myself please give me money I'm so poor <laughs> and, and it doesn't it's a damp dampener on your own practice yeah totally yeah mm -hmm. I agree with that so you certainly have some sort of it's like arrogance is approachable like yes. people are approached yeah. to arrogance like oh, that person's cocky and they love themselves. I'm going to go and buy their work because they're like that. And I'm like, but they're a cunt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think there's something in that where it's like, I think that a lot of art buyers subconsciously will buy certain types of art because they want to absorb some of the energy that's within that. Mm -hmm. When you've got a desperation to your practice, they don't want to take that on. Mm -hmm. But if it's like, if someone is a cocky cunt, mm -hmm. then they'll be like, I would like to be more confident in myself. Yeah. Let me take a bit of this. Yeah. It's an absorption thing. Yeah. So yeah, it has maybe an idea. Like, yeah. look at the, I'm going to start looking at the bits of myself that I showed. Like, what is it? Mad Witch. Yeah. Basically, that's my vibe. Yeah. So anyone who wants to... <laughs> mad Witch. Pretty much. Uh, mad Witch that has a lot to say about mushrooms. Yeah. It's like, that's pretty much what my whole thing is. Um, uh. Yeah. Uh, so that's... Like, I mean... As as working class artists, we round it up now. Can you see my little all of it there? Um, I mean, like it, it is kind of the internal struggle, is that feeling of of abandonment. Mm -hmm. And then, if most of it, I know I have, I know a lot of my friends have as well. Mm -hmm. There was always that feeling of neglect and abandonment issues that come through with these things, and you can't yeah. help but feel it's almost amplified mm -hmm. by the by the art scene, mm -hmm. feeling left behind, yeah, feeling totally. care about struggle. Yeah, and it's like if you can't pretend to be. Um, some privileged little shit who can just take drugs all night and then just yeah. splatter their body and paint and throw themselves up against a canvas and mm -hmm. make you bullshit art then yeah. who are you? Yeah, see there's a, been actually a couple of occasions that I'll, I'll be going in to like sort of like um, artist run galleries and I'll be going into hand in a bit of work and I, I'll be feeling like oh, is my work good enough? Like it's on a £1.50 canvas it's been £1 uh, pound stretch of paint on it like these people must be using like really good equipment and materials. Like, is that should I be here? You know what I mean? Like, it's just um, ah, it's a bit of self doubt. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Get um, that the fuck, pal. Yeah. Um, one of my advices actually. So when you're using, um, if you're using cheap materials, mm -hmm. repurpose them in a way that's not thought of. So if it's all, if it's if you're painting on a canvas, mm -hmm. um, and it's been stretched, take it off the stretcher. Yeah. And um, and put that up. Canvas used as um, as paper is beautiful. There's so many different ways in which you can use things. Fucking wankers, the only fucking door. <coughs> Sorry, they're my people. I can't even argue with them. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's like I think that that's what I find really interesting when I've been doing any arts production is that mm -hmm. if people have got limitations, find ways to navigate them. Yeah. That's what forms a practice. Mm -hmm. That's what my tutors and my masters told me. It's like mm -hmm. that's if people don't have any boundaries, then how would they know how how to navigate those boundaries? Yeah, we are given a shit ton of barriers because mm -hmm. of our economic bracket. Yeah, not totally. So yeah. like, how do you navigate them? That's where your practice forms. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for speaking mm -hmm. with me, Ryan. I really appreciate it. Oh no, I've had fun. And it's been nice. Come and hang out with me and Lewis for the rest of the day as much as you want of to. Um, <laughs> uh, anything you want to plug actually before we go? Is there anything, any work that you're wanting to talk about? Um, try to think. Well, right now, I'm still really developing. Um, the past few weeks, I've tried to make a new platform for myself, just started a new sort of social media so I can start and kind of just develop in my own style. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm aye, just watch it for it. Okay, <laughs> it well, for what's it. your Instagram? Um, right now, it is Dr. Rizla. Dr. Rizla, my, yeah. my Dr. Beast. Well, oh, yeah. yeah, not pedo though. <laughs> Um, everyone, keeps, everyone from the south keeps on telling me it means pedo and rapist. I'm like, no, it's not. I'm from the north. It means awesome. <sighs> oh yeah. And I'm, I was gonna get it on the side of my van, Doctor Beast. And yeah. I was like, I can't go to fucking Glasgow again if I. Do. I know. I'm calling myself a doctor. I didn't have a degree. <laughs> I was I was gonna do a PhD and I thought it was gonna be great. I'd be actually called call Doctor Beast, but yeah. <laughs> anyway, Doctor Rizla will find you. Yeah. Thank definitely. you so much, Ryan. Yeah. Thank you.